like I said earlier, is homeless. It was him on that yacht and then where? So he arrives in Europe and takes a special Pullman car all the way to Austria, where since he has nowhere to go and it's been discovered by his friends that he has nowhere to go, the Bar Baron Eugene and Kitty Rothschild open up their home um, of Schloss Enzenfeld and it's just outside of Vienna and they let him stay there indefinitely um, until he and Wallace can come together and be married and make up their own home. Now, you guys, Kitty Rothschild is hosting him. As I've alluded to in the last episode and in this one, you are going to be shocked at the way he treats her and her home and her generosity. It is mind-blowing. I don't know if I've ever read about somebody who is this entitled and who is this shameful and without manners. Well, his initial euphoria had now vanished at the reality of his position. On Sunday, the 13th of December, the Archbishop of Canterbury had preached his sermon berating the Duke for seeking, as he said it, happiness in a manner inconsistent with the Christian principle of marriage and within a social circle whose standards and ways of life are alien to the best instincts of his people. Ruined by his disastrous liking for vulgar society and by his infatuation for Miss Simpson. The Duke had been sufficiently angry to consult his lawyer about a lawsuit over that sermon that was preached. So, I mean, Megan and Harry, where are you? That sounds exactly like the sort of thing they would do. But he's realizing that this romantic gesture that he feels he's living out, this fantasy that he's living out, is not being supported. And up until this point, he'd been sort of able to just sort of breeze past everybody else's tears and angst about it because he was getting his way. But now that he's homeless and has nowhere to go and he's having to fall on the, you know, kindness of his, you know, extensive group of friends, now he's starting to realize that maybe it isn't all as beautiful as he once thought it was. Well, not only did the Archbishop of Canterbury have a couple of spicy words for him, but even those closest to him who had worked for him were so glad to wash their hands of him. It says here, there was a relief in official circles that the abdication crisis seemed to have blown over and the couple neutralized. Amongst those who knew the Duke well, he was not missed. Harold Nicholson noted in his diary after lunching on the 14th of December with the Duke's former assistant private secretary, Sir Alan Tommy Lassels, how he, quote, is so relieved at the fall of his master that he was almost indiscreet. He says that the king was like the child in the fairy story who was given every gift except a soul. There was nothing in him which understood the intellectual or spiritual sides of life, and that all art, poetry, music, etc. were dead to him. He had no friends in this country, nobody whom he would ever wish to see again. He was without a soul, and this made him a trifle mad. He never cared for England or the English. He hated his country since he had no soul, and he did not like being reminded of his duties. That's a pretty damning sketch. Um, you have to wonder how much of that is true and how much of it was written um, as a response to the stinging unfairness of the whole situation. You know, I mean, to repeatedly three times say this person had no soul is pretty alarming. But I mean, obviously it's hyperbole. Yet I do think that he was of such profound uh, mental, emotional, and intellectual capacity he was so bereft of these things that I, I suppose being around him was tiring you know this man has so much power and yet he seems to have no skills talents or abilities it probably was very tiring to be around him and though I but I but that almost leads me to say so why are we sad he had to leave he sounds like a terrible person sounds like e England has fallen you know ass backwards into all the luck in the world that he found Wallace Simpson well, this damning sketch is shared by the Prime Minister Robert Bernays, who had ruminated in his diary only a few days earlier, quote, he hasn't one real friend to lean upon in this frightful emergency. His case seems to be arrested development. He's never passed the stage from boyhood to manhood. He is the spoiled child of success with the film star mentality. He sees his job only in terms of cheering crowds. He has never thought the matter out. 
He imagined that he would quietly retire into private life, leaving his brother to perform the dreary ceremonial functions while he spent a tranquil life gardening at Fort Belvedere and holidaying on the Riviera, occasionally emerging, emerging to open a hospital or review the fleet and receive the cheers that mean so much to him. For the first time, he has been brought up against the fact that abdication means exile and that for the rest of his life, he can serve no useful purpose. Well, was that written about Harry or was that written about David? Because both of those men seem to be equally described in this passage. Yes, this, these people, both of these men act like spoiled children uh, with a film star mentality. Arrested development. Absolutely. How many times did we make that diagnosis when we were reading other books about Harry? And even this, he never even thought the matter out. How would it really go if he left his country? How would people really feel about that? And how he thinks he can just re retire quietly to private life while his brother picks up the pieces, while his brother does all the hard work. And he thinks that he's just going to be able to come out and open that hospital or examine the fleet and everyone's just going to cheer for him and then he can just go back to doing whatever. That's exactly what Harry thought was going to happen. You know, I mean, what does matter with these men? You know, why are they just so selfish and so uh, entitled to all of their own happiness at the expense of everybody else's? After these two separate horrific character sketches by two separate people, we can assume that having David in your home would have been a trial akin to nothing else that Kitty Rothschild had ever experienced. In the greatest understatement of the year, Lowney states that Windsor was not an easy house guest. Kitty Rothschild had brought staff from her home in Paris and made great efforts to ensure the Schloss was welcoming, giving him a suite of rooms comprising of a bedroom, a drawing room, a library, a smoking room, a bathroom, and yet he remained depressed and frustrated. He had a bad attitude every time she saw him. He spent his entire time watching Mickey Mouse movies, he went sightseeing, he walked, he played golf and skittles and skied, and once a week he took a Turkish bath in Vienna. There were card games where he played for high stakes, and when he won, he cheerfully collected his winnings. Everyone's got to give him his due, but when he lost, suddenly he didn't have to pay. It was just a game. I'm not, I'm not going to pay you. It was just a card game. Come on. But he wanted to make sure he got his winnings when it was his turn to win. He distracted himself, according to Piers Lee, who had remained with him, by playing the jazz drums very loud, along with a, a gramophone record. He also drank quite a lot of brandy, and he performed, and I find this to be almost the most egregious of the things that he did. He performed his celebrated imitation of Winston Churchill trying to persuade him not to abdicate. Isn't that the most childish of all the things? Even more childish than sitting there watching Mickey Mouse films or playing the drums to a gramophone record. To mock the man who cared so much for his country that he wept because you were leaving, who tried desperately to get you to stay, and then as a parlor trick, you would do that imitation for everybody. That is so sickening to me. Now, if all that wasn't enough, there he is playing the drums in your upstairs room, you know, to this blaring music that's going on. He does nothing all day but amuse himself. And he has the gall to complain to you every time you see him. Then there was the matter of his huge shopping bills. Okay, now listen to this. When he shopped, he sent the bills to the British legation where no one knew what to do with them. Why are you sending your shopping bills to us? We, we're not going to pay for this. Until an equerry, probably Piers Lee himself, paid them out of his own pocket. You guys, hear me when I say to you this. David had money. We're going to go on to talk about how much money he had. People had no idea how much he'd squirreled away and really, quite frankly, where it was all coming from. He'd been squirreling cash away for years, okay? So for him to go out shopping and then send his bills to the British legation and be like, you guys got that? Shocking. Shocking. And then his servant ends up paying them out of his own pocket. But then, listen to this. Eventually, the British government said the purchases were not their responsibility, and then they sent the bills to the Rothschilds. Are you hearing what is coming out of my mouth? David would go shopping. When he couldn't get the British government to pay his bills, the British government billed 
the Rothschilds, his host, they've opened up their home. They've, they're bringing staff in from their Paris home. They are giving him a lavish suite of rooms. They're entertaining him day and night. And then they get his shopping bills and he lets them pay them. The unmitigated gall of this man is astounding to me. I cannot even believe this. I just, it's so humiliating. You are a, you are next king. You are not poor. You, you, are, you are not begging from scraps. Why are you going out and letting your host and hostess pay your bills? This is an embarrassment. Anyway, uh, to compound all of his negative behavior, uh, not only him being an unbelievably unpleasant house guest, but then spending tons of money and then being like, uh, you guys are going to pay my bills, right? Oh, you, you got it? You got it? Okay, good, good. He spent much of his time on the phone to Wallace. The bill at the end of his stay came out to 800 pounds, which he too expected the Rothschilds to cover. I meant to look this up before I started filming and I did not. Uh, but even to this day, if somebody was at my house and then handed me just an $800 bill that I had nothing to do with, I'd be like, what the hell is this? But 800 pounds in 1936, how much is that? Can somebody do the math for us and tell us? It's gotta be astronomical. He missed Wallace. Perry Brownlow, his loyal friend who had escorted Wallace to the South of France in December now joined him. And this is a shocking description of David's behavior. David invited Perry into his rooms to talk. They talked until three o'clock in the morning. And Perry witnessed that all around David's bed, propped up on chairs, on tables, were pictures of Wallace. And he counted 16 photographs encircling David in his bed. And then to put the cherry on top of this creepy Sunday, David would curl up and sleep with a pillow that had her initials on it. Ugh, ugh, what is the matter with this man? Perry Brownlow said that it was as if he were in a crypt and there watching him fall asleep to this, you know, cuddled up to this little pillow that belonged to her that had WS on it. Just really creeped Perry out and I don't blame him. Now, do any of us understand this relationship that he has with Wallace Simpson? Certainly I do not because the author says that David was constantly belittled and undermined by Wallace. So he's got that negative situation going on. Every time he's on the phone with her, it's just, yeah, 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 yeah. She's never happy, but he's come, you know, to compound all of his emotional troubles with her. He's also angered by his family's refusal to acknowledge the woman he loved and the protracted financial negotiations. Why are they taking so long and dragging their feet? Why won't they just let him marry his, his girlfriend? Windsor, at this time, had become paranoid, and he later admitted that it was a sense of powerlessness that brought him close to the breaking point. He says, I could do nothing but wait and count the days, which he did. At the end of every day, he would check off a date until he could see the love of his life. The situation was not helped because Wallace was constantly, you know, jumping at his throat because she believed that he was in an affair with Kitty Rothschild. And she wanted to gripe to him every time they were on the phone about how she knew there was something going on between them. Now you and I both know that she was just complaining to complain. First of all, this woman has got, has got multiple affairs going all over the time on her own. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that she'd be okay with him having an affair, but the very fact that she would think that he ha was having an affair with Kitty Rothschild is ridiculous. And the way we can tell is this. When David was in love with somebody, he would lavish them with gifts beyond our wildest imagination. He may not have been able to spend two pennies for anything normal, but when it came to lavishing his lovers with gifts, again, the bottom of the purse knew no bounds. He has not given one thing to Kitty Rothschild that is due her, not even the kindness of a smile because he's constantly griping against her. There are no gifts being given to Kitty Rothschild as we'll discuss in a minute. There is not even the common decency to pay his own bills. Wallace Simpson should have been able to know, and I believe she did know, that there was no love between the two of them. That Kitty and David definitely did not have something going on. She's just trying to be a good friend. And I mean, he was, he's the ex-king. 
if you have a home and you have the ability to open it up and you are um, a kind enough hostess to do so, I think that it is not beyond reason that you would say, okay, you know, I've got this other house. It's in um, Austria, you know, let me help you in your time of need. If she was a friend of his, that makes sense that she would have done that. But there's no, there's, there, there could be no truth behind the fact that Wallace really believed there was an affair happening, please. The Duke continued to be alternately short-tempered, sullen, bored, and depressed. Can you even imagine it? Here Kitty Rothschild is laying the supper table every night with her best silver and crystal. She's got all the maids, you know, running hither and there for this man, and all he can do is complain. Kitty Rothschild tried her best laying on musical entertainment at Christmas Eve with entertainers and musicians from Paris. But who could not be bothered to show up? David! David could not be bothered to show up. Here she has planned entertainment from France. And he's like, gonna skip it. I think I'll watch Mickey Mouse instead. It gets worse. Then, the next day, being Christmas, on his dinner tray, she had placed a gift. What might that gift be? A set of sapphire studs from Cartier. Beautiful cufflinks from Cartier. And somehow it catches him unawares. And he says, oh, sorry. Mm, thanks for the gift. I didn't really get you anything. Uh, but don't worry, I'm going to get you something. Don't worry, don't worry. I got something planned. And then later that day, what does he give her? An autographed picture of himself. That's so lame and junky. That is so lame and junky. How about pay some of the bills that have been piling up? That would be a Christmas present. I despise this man with every fiber of my being. I dislike him maybe even more than I dislike Harry. <laughs> and that's really saying something. Um, now, because he's so down in the dumps, he asks that his friend, his dear friend, Edward Fruity Metcalf, help, come help him in his dire need. You know, he's just devastated about where his life is. He's just lonely. Old Kitty's not bringing it like she should. He's still depressed, you know, and would his friend come and see him? So out of the generosity of old uh, Edward Metcalf's heart, he decides to come. Now, I would say that Edward Fruity Metcalf is a man of questionable uh, associations. His wife, uh, used to be the mistress of Oswald Mosley, who was the president of the fascist chapter in England. So I would say that perhaps old Fruity Metcalf, as they called him, uh, was not all he could be. But regardless, he comes to his friend in his time of need. And I'm grateful for him because he has some choice piece, pieces to relate to us about David's behavior behind the scenes. He's writing daily letters to his wife, telling her about all the shenanigans over at the Schloss. And he says to his wife, of course, David's on the line for hours and hours every day to Cannes, meaning to Mrs. Simpson. He says, I somehow don't think these talks go well sometimes. She seems to be always picking on him or complaining about something that she thinks he hasn't done and ought to do. All he is living for is to be with her on the 27th April. As we came back every night after skiing, he says, one more day nearly over very pathetic. Never have I seen a man more madly in love. The problems continued, relayed in Fruity's daily letters to Baba, his wife. He called her Baba. She is at him every day on the phone. He always seems to be excusing himself for something or other, wrote Fruity on January 27th. I feel so sorry for him. He's never able to do what she considers the right thing. And then he wrote, the evenings lately have been dreadful. He won't think of bed before 3 a.m. And now, he started playing the accordion and the bagpipes. Y'all, it was the drums before, but now he's dragged out the bagpipes. God have mercy. Last night, there was a terrible row on the phone. Wallace said she'd heard that he was having an affair with Kitty. This is damn funny, but I can tell you it's no joke last night. He got into a terrible state. Their conversation lasted nearly two hours. And then he goes on to say, David pays for as little as he can when we go anywhere. I don't believe I'll be able to stick it here much longer. And the other person who was real sick and tired of the whole thing was Kitty Rothschild herself. I mean, she had done everything for this guy and the complete and total ingrate is what he was. Kitty Rothschild had had enough and that day she returned to Paris. The Duke was still in bed and as Fruity reported, never saw her to say goodbye or thank her for all that she had done. 
She was frightfully hurt, and I don't blame her. He's awfully difficult at times, and this is the worst thing he's done yet. I went down to the station with a letter which I got him to write to her, and that made things a bit better. He also never saw the servants to tip them or thank them. All due to more damn talking to cans. He never stops. Can you even believe this? His hostess, who has done everything for him this entire time. She, he's so ungrateful to her, she finally decides to just go home. And he doesn't even have the common decency to get out of bed to say goodbye to her. Nor does he have the common decency even to write her a thank you note until Metcalf was like, hey, dude, could you not thank the lady for everything she's done? Here's a piece of paper. Here's a pen. Say these things. Write them down. I'll go take it to her. But don't do this. This is so rude. 